Good morning and welcome to the Alexandra Wenman Show. I'm here in beautiful London, it's actually still very mild, and I'm here in Stoke Newington in North London at 34.4. Skincare Apothecary uh, with the lovely Elka DeWitt who's very kindly agreed to speak to me today about her gorgeous products, her ethos, her philosophy and how she came to get started. So Elka, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an <laughs> absolute pleasure. And as you can see guys, all in front of us, we have Elka's beautiful products and she has this gorgeous little space here at um, the, the courtyard just off Bovary Road in Stoke Newington off Church Street. So if you're up here, come and have a wander and have a have a look. So Elka, tell me, how did you get started with all of this? Well, initially I had really, really bad skin. So in fact, God, it you was, wouldn't know yeah. it at all. It's the 34.4 <laughs> effect. Amazing. Uh, so I, st and, and simultaneously, because these things always do happen simultaneously, I was also helping on an apiary. And on that apiary, they were throwing all their beeswax away. Oh, wow. Um, and I did a bit of reading about it and realized that actually beeswax is a really terrific thing to use in products. So I was experimenting. The Egyptians used to use it, didn't they? Yeah. It goes right back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a very, very old um, uh, method. of. Uh, it actually helps sealing in your mo moisture. Um, and, it, and it works really like a protective layer on your skin. So um, I, I worked on this for a while and developed the Honey Balm, which is t today still our best-selling product. Yeah. Um, and it sorted out my skin problems. Have we got one here to show? Yes, we've got a. I've got it right at the front. <laughs> just <laughs> just reach here. over here. Uh, there you go. This is a Honey Balm. I love the packaging as well. So this is. It, it's a very smooth cream, and people often get really worried by having something that's a pure oil, which this is. Could I try a yeah, little bit? Yeah, sure. On here? It's apricot kernel oil, beeswax, oh. and honey. And you can use it as a lip balm, <gasps> you can use it as a moisturizer, you can use it as a primer under makeup, oh, which is e even more incredible. And you can also use it as a makeup remover. What I love about yeah. this actually is it looks greasier in the pot than yeah. it actually is when yeah. you put it on your skin. It's, yeah. it's really, it actually smooths on really It's nice. very soothing. So when I travel, oh, that's the only thing I travel oh. with now. Oh, it smells nice. It's very subtle, but yeah. it is kind of like, Oh, it's like having your honey on your crumpet in That's the water. It. It's I mean, very it does, comforting smell. Yeah. yeah, it does also contain honey. So honey also kills bacteria. Um, and I mean, it is a really great skin product for sensitive skin. Wow. Which is, a, I effectively found out that I'm allergic to virtually everything that's a preservative, anything that's a chemical. Um, and so actually creating a pure product with only three ingredients was the, was the answer. And that's where I began. Mm three ingredients you never that's hear it. of that anymore yeah, do you it's it. like there's always you go on the back and it's like all these words I don't know what that means something rather sulfates and whatever I mean we've got our back here that's just this description the ingredients are just here it's literally three, three little lines, lines. That's yeah it. amazing yeah. so uh, so that's where I began really and uh, how long ago was that uh, seven years well yeah then it took uh, well actually that was eight years and then the f after the first year, I started developing other products. So these ones all originate from that. because Basically, because my friends said, oh, can't you make something else as well for us? Because I was just giving it away as presents. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I created that other range. Um, and then people kept encouraging me to, to start, a, start a business and selling it. And I really wasn't interested mm. because I'm not motivated by money. I'm... I'm not mot motivated by um, just selling for myself and, and I'd had a business before uh, selling greetings cards, handmade ones and distributing for other people and had found it very, very lonely. So you know also the, the stress of running your yeah. own business too already, right? Yeah. So yeah. it is a tough thing to really venture yeah. into. Yeah. So, so um, uh, there, there came a period after about three years of developing the, this initial product range where I actually came to a full stop. I really thought, I, I, I'm just not motivated to carry on like this. So in fact, what I did is I just sat with that thought and uh, spent a lot of time walking around Clissold Park, which is about two minutes away from so here. Cool, just yeah, there. I love it. And, yeah. um, and also meditating. I did a lot of yoga. And after about three months, my husband showed me a little newspaper clipping um, t which was an organization in the East End that uh, um, had a competition once a year for people to apply for funding who were going to do something social oh, wow. uh, as a business. So um, the really great thing about that was we didn't get the funding, but 
during that time uh, we got a lot of free advice a friend of mine came on board to help with all the um, the figures and the presentations and things planting like that planting seeds of ideas right the social aspect of it must have been yes. something so the, that so the social aspect I suddenly got more interested but I still wasn't really feeling feeling it until during that whole process we actually were given the free advice of somebody who uh, who does company formation so he helps you decide is it going to be a cooperative is it going to be a limited company that kind of thing and um, although I didn't meet him my friend met him and she told him about me and he said this person sounds like she'd really be keen on founding a CIC so a CIC is a community interest company Okay. Um, basically what you do when you found a CIC which is what we have actually done it's a it's a registered CIC is it becomes this company actually belongs to the community oh wow yeah so it doesn't if I step away from it somebody else can take, can it, take over. it over I don't actually own it that's such an amazing idea yeah. that's so <laughs> much more inclusive yeah and so it's so, a new paradigm right? yeah this that's is, it this is brilliant yeah so so all of a sudden, as soon as I heard that and, and heard what that was about, I got really, really excited. And I realized I'm going to go for it now because really I want to prove that you can make a ton of money and give a ton of mon money away. Yeah. So we've now set up that uh, once we go into profit, because we're not in profit yet, 60% um, of those profits are earmarked to be given to other social causes, which we can then um, decide what they are. Because the other thing is we didn't get anywhere in that competition there were only seven people elected to go into that second stage so we got through to that stage and got all the free advice um, but we didn't get the funding so m many of my friends were really distraught about that because it was 20 grand's worth of funding oh, wow. but you had to have spent it within eight weeks of receiving it and have been launched as a company. So you really need to know what you're doing before you go yes. in for the competition, yeah. don't yeah. you? Otherwise you're yeah. just like, oh my yeah. God, the pressure. I mean, we would have spent that money on things that I we absolutely didn't need. I mean, so for example, on equipment, and I'm still using my Kenwood mixer, you know? <laughs> so, but I would have bought 5,000 pounds worth of equipment, you know, spent it on lab equipment, all of that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and our lab was really put together with um, collected pieces, people donated things. So, oh. in fact, it was a much better process that we didn't have the money. And almost like the universe proving to you that you can do something out of virtually nothing. That's right? it. That's, That's it. incredible. Well, and also, when the money didn't come through, um, a friend of mine immediately said, Why on earth didn't you tell me? I'll lend you the money for nothing. <laughs> so, you, you know, didn't want anything. No, like that. so no interest charged. We can pay back when, when we can. Um, and no strings attached wow. because the fact was that donation that if we'd won the competition we would have had to have spent twenty thousand pounds yeah we and would you, have and now you don't have a limit on how you spend it or yeah. what you do with yeah it. she's like coming like an angel yeah. hasn't she that's it i mean that's the thing that's the thing that i found is that actually when when you when you're working on good then actually good always comes in to feed it. Mm. So, um, I mean, now, for example, all our packaging, so this is all packaged in-house. So um, it looks like it's the bee colors too, yeah. I love it. The yeah. little black and yellow. So all of that packaging is done by volunteers. Yeah. Um, all the labeling is done by volunteers. So everything that you can see around you is actually done by volunteers um, and including the staffing of the shop because of course I'm a volunteer. Yeah, so, and you say so you've created a whole community around this. Yes. Yeah. This is so lovely. Yeah. It's it's so the way forward I think in yeah. business and yeah. this collective, like, yeah, I love the, the collective, the community approach, the people working together and supporting each other and lifting each other is really lovely. Well, I mean the, the, the thing is sometimes people, people who are a, a bit cynical about it say, oh, you, you're really good at roping people into work for nothing but nobody says that about Oxfam no you and know you nobody know, says it getting it, something yeah. out of it yeah. as well. nobody says it about charity shops nobody says it about a uh, volunteering in all manner of other um, walks of life and I reckon that's the reason we didn't get funding mm. is because people don't believe that an, a commercial company which is effectively what this is mm. uh, will do something um, out of altruistic 
um, intentions. Yeah. And that's why I think people, uh, well, we don't certainly don't uh, attract venture capital because, of course, nobody's going to make money out of it. Mm. Yeah. So actually, the only capital you can attract is from altruistic people, mm. donations. So we raised a lot of money when we did all the testing of the products. Um, that was all through just giving. So that's all just by donation. That's really good. Um, and I think now we, we're attracting more and more volunteers. So we have uh, photographers who vote photograph um, we're just starting another photo um, shoot for um, for our social media we have a volunteer who does all our social media now um, because and who designed the packaging because it's so beautifully done well, well my designer who designed all the the whole con um, the look of the company is actually Jamie Wignall who's local okay. um, who I knew before um, I just I love look at these yeah. beautiful they're almost oldie worldy apothecary like jars it's really yeah. magical yeah. I love it yeah well that also they radiate at a different level because they're not black they're yeah. actually um, they're actually violet oh so I a think lot of it's funny because they yeah. almost look brownish yeah. They're violet. Yeah, so they're violet. Violet flame, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so he designed all of that. I knew him before. We had somebody else who was doing all the branding and it didn't work out. Um, and then, again, what I did is I t just took a step back and thought, who do I know who I like? And then, actually, he came to mind because I, I was managing property and so I actually had access to him and his girlfriend's property and always liked what he had up on the walls. I knew that he was learning to be a graphic designer. Um, and so he um, he's actually done all the branding apart from the name um, and when I came to him with the soaps I said my, my, my remit was I really don't want to package them in wax paper mm. or just with a string so that they, they I just don't want them to look uh, sort of crafty yeah and he said to well, look yeah. still slick yeah, yeah. yeah. and I and so he I, I, I said I'd prefer to have black paper and he said well why don't we just use black paper with yellow yellow string yeah so yeah. that's what it's we've so got so simple but it just yeah. looks amazing it all it's I think it's it, I mean then it's very hip like very hipster as well <laughs> um, so it fits well in Stokey <laughs> yeah that's right yeah but tell us about the bees because you have a real passion for bees right yeah. so <clears throat> tell us a little bit about what you do around bees and it's bee knowledge isn't it basically well uh, so I mean, the, the company is called 34.4 so 3.44 percent of every sale including now although we're not in profit goes to the natural beekeeping trust so my passion is actually with the way the natural beekeeping trust is trying to change how we look at bees um the old i i consider the old model of bee, beekeeping is um square boxes um the brood gets kept in the bottom box the two top um, boxes are for honey um beekeepers even uh, uh, non-commercial beekeepers take off the two top boxes ha harvest that honey leave the bees only with what's in the brood box and feed sugar to actually maximize what they have for the winter so I'm not a fan of taking off all the honey um, and also I'm not a fan of they tends to be taken off in August and then what happens is that the bees in the middle of August there there aren't actually a lot of flowering plants but they're still collecting for winter so what happens is you just take all that energy away you feed them sugars to make them think oh well I've got enough stock but actually they'll still go out and fly for more so you're working them working them and working them because people always say bees are really hard working um, but I've actually witnessed bees flying from the hive sitting in a little bush just hanging just out chilling out in the flowers and then and then coming maybe just going to a couple of flowers picking up a little bit of nectar going back and pretending they've been on a long and, journey and also rubbing their little bottoms yeah. around in the, i love yeah. it when you see the bumblebees the little buff yeah. bottom ones yeah so yeah, this is like rubbing them yeah. stuff rolling around yeah, in the pollen. It. it's so adorable yeah. they're so cute it's like a little pussy cat like yeah. having a little rub, run around yeah like, run around the flower amazing so, so yeah so 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 really that conventional kind of beekeeping is what the Natural Beekeeping Trust is working against. Um, what they're really trying to show people is that it should be about the bees, mm. it shouldn't be about honey. So the reason bees are talked about so much and people are so like, oh, when the bees die, we die. Well, first of all, there are a lot of other pollinators, mm. a lot. It's not just bumblebees, there are a lot of insects that are also pollinators. The reason we are so interested in bees it's because they produce honey. Yeah. Not a doubt about it. Yeah. You know, it's we get what something we, out of it. What right? we get out <laughs> yeah. of it. 
so, so typical humans yeah. always thinking of ourselves that's it, yeah. that's it because they they're productive so I, I didn't have bees this this year but in previous years when I've had a hive or two hives I've never harvested any honey um, we don't actually use a lot of honey in our products so one jar of honey will keep me going for a year yeah. so we use tiny quantities but even when I've had hives people the first question people always ask me is how much honey did you get so my stock answer is when did you last milk your dog yeah <laughs> oh my god or your cat yeah it's what about just the love of the bees yeah so uh, when i was a child i had a fish tank and, and i used to just love watching the fish just interacting and effectively that's what i did with the beehive yeah. it's it's very calming really lovely and really really interesting and um minimal invasion so a lot of people open up every week um, there's a, a lot of uh, problem with things like varroa and people get very very um, het up about it What's I have varroa? no varroa is a mite that infects bees right okay um, and it's it's rife all over Europe and um, pe people spray their bees for it with it uh, with uh, pesticides um, bee friendly pesticides to get rid of them they do all manner of things to get rid of them but my gut instinct I have no proof of this but my gut instinct is is that if you're working bees to the max, um, they don't really have the same energy to ward off yeah. other things. It's like the immune system probably gets yeah. knocked about a bit, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know enough about the biology to, to say that 100%, but it's just my gut feeling about it. But also, if you take off all the honey and then feed sugar, so sugar is just calories. Honey contains minerals, mm. contains pollen, so with their um, protein, all of that kind of thing. So you're feeding them just calories. Natural. It's like us drinking dairy milk, right? Yeah. That milk is made for cows. Yes. You know, like yeah. it's the same with honey. It's made for bees. It's yes. like it's their sustenance. Yes. It's interesting that yeah. we do that. Yeah. I must ask my uncle actually. I have a, in my family in Australia I have a farm. And my uncle and aunt have started beekeeping and making local honey. Yeah. So I must ask them how they're doing it yeah. and make sure it is. I'm sh I know that it's only a very small um, sort of in like thing for them on the side of the farm. Yeah. But I'll have to ask them. Well, the, the key question yeah. is, do you feed sugar? Yeah. That's I'll the ask, key question. I'll ask them. Yeah. So, so the the people from the Natural Beekeeping Trust, for example, um, believe that actually you shouldn't harvest in the summer. If you're going to harvest honey, it should be in spring, because then it's what the bees have left over. Yeah, and then they can still go out and have fun yeah. in the flowers. Well, yeah, and, and then and then they, the new crop of flowers is there for them to gather. Yeah. So you're just you're just using up the old the old things, and also they 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 um, they have workshops where you, where they make sun hives, which are this sort of shape. So, which is much more natural. Yeah. I mean, no bee will choose to live in a box. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'll go and live in a box if you've just provided and one. And they're just all squashed up against yeah. the glass. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, there are lots of uh, people now, um, hive developments where one wall is glass. Well, I mean, bees don't like light in mm. their houses. It's just for us to be able to see it. Mm. Um, those slices that they pull out. Yeah. Where you can, Look, here's the bee. And the poor yeah. bees are like, ah! Yeah, yeah. So, so, those are, so those are frames. So they sit on those frames. But even that, they put in the beeswax. Um, you can print onto, onto wax so that you have the... the initial print for the bees normally they make their own hexagons so it's quite interesting also that these hexagons that we print for them to put their honey in are bigger than what they would produce what in real life make. because of course it's easier to extract honey from bigger units oh so my god what are we doing that. like yeah. why do people have to it's the same with gm fruits and vegetables why do we need to change what mother nature yeah. gave us it's all like she's so what about irregular well, because shapes people, uh, well um, in that case instance it's because people are, uh, uh, have a real fear of food shortage whereas if they used resources properly that we currently have they wouldn't be and don't over consume which yeah. is what we do most yeah. of the time don't we yeah we just sort of like hungry hoarders it's weird That's i it. think i think it's to do with the, this we've obviously got this something in our collective cellular memory around like catastrophobia or something it, that yeah. we think there's going to be an apocalypse yeah. they keep playing apocalyptic movies <laughs> so we're hoarding and like stocking up for things so um the the natural beekeeping trust for example uh does courses on making a sun hive so the sun hive shape is like this as opposed to a square box and what happens inside the hive is at the bottom half is for the brood 
then they fill up to the top with their their honey stores and then mostly they also make a little square box on the top and that's for extra oh. so if that is still left in in spring then the beekeeper can have that Oh. So it's a totally different attitude. It's it's really and it's it, like thank you bees for your yes. o- little offering of yes. honey, like and we will provide a safe haven for you um, in return. So that's the kind of um, conversation that I like to engage vegans in, is that we'll we'll now be sourcing our beeswax and honey from that organisation, which helps that organisation to actually go forth and spread that message. They're also currently running a project to rewild the environment with wild bees. They're doing that here and in Spain. They've got one started. So, in fact, our 3.44% that goes to them actually helps an organisation like that that I really honestly think is going to change how we look at beekeeping. Because the state of beekeeping at the moment is really, very, really very, very similar to what battery farming of hens is. Yeah, these, yeah. You know, it's just make them work, 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 take all the honey off, feed sugar, make them work without uh, respite. So, um, so that's why I, I would also say that vegans should look at who they're buying their food from because I reckon that most of the crops that we're eating, um, fruit and crops and everything, are actually pollinated by commercial beekeepers mm. who will be harvesting all the honey. And working the bees too yeah. hard. Wow. And, and then you often find also that if you buy only lavender honey or only um, a particular crop of honey, well that presupposes that those hives get moved to a field next to where the lavender is and once they've got the lavender, all that lavender honey will take be taken off um, with new, um, new uh, boxes put on f- to collect the next stock. So then they move them to another field for a different Poor plant. bees and they don't yeah. even get the benefit of all that work that they've yeah. done themselves. Well, I mean, so. some of it will stay in the brood box, but they won't have the stores. So the other thing that I always encourage people is, is to eat diverse honey. So wildflower honey mm. um, or honey that that is not just one crop. Um, yeah. yeah, so so that I, I, I do do talks on that kind of thing as well. So basically about bees. Yeah. Yeah, and you all of the You also do talks about the skincare though, don't you? So yeah. tell us a little bit about that side of things. So uh, the skincare talks are titled Skin is the largest organ of the body. How does your mind affect it? Mm. Because uh, what I've discovered over my years now of, of dealing with people directly is that a lot of skin issues are actually exactly exhibiting what the person's mental state is so quite often people have eczema on their hands because they hate their jobs yeah because it's like you're working your hands to the bone right yeah and the hands are going no yeah that's it um quite often they have problems um here is to do with communication here is to do with power loss so they they get rashes here and and i mean i've had those issues myself so i've 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 seen myself how um, changing myself has actually changed my skin yeah. um, and also uh, during these talks I also talk about that you shouldn't really block up all your time I'm, I'm quite bad at that I mean I do do it quite a lot but in the time that I actually uh, started this brand I had about three or four months where I had no idea what I was doing so th- at that point is when I was walking around the park a lot doing a lot of yoga and meditation and my mantra was, I have no idea what I'm doing with my life, and that's o- all right. And that's okay. Yeah. It's brilliant because yeah. then you're like you're opening up space for yeah. the ideas to drop in. It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. How, so, how did you come up with the actual 34.4 name in the first place? Okay, so the, the name I only ever tell people right at the very end. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> the secret. <laughs> Because it's it's almost magical. I actually did a talk. Well, when I do my talks, I never mention what it means, and so the audience by the end, there's always one very um, brave person who asks me because everybody's thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and I once had a numerologist who who sent me a two-page crazy of what those numbers mean, and they're highly significant. They're to do with long-term planning, long-term commitment, um, ethical stances, all of that kind of thing. So, in fact, it's amazing that, that we chose those numbers. And they add up to 11 they, as yeah, well. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah so yeah. They're, they're, it's quite significant. But in effect, 34.4, I'm going to tell you now, because this is a secret, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah, we're not letting it out of the bag. <laughs> so 34.4 is the optimum temperature in the brood part of the beehive for the brood 
to develop to their optimum. Oh. So if it's a, it's a, if it's one degree or so out, then you tend to find that there are issues inside the hive, health issues. So we've taken that a step further because it's a social enterprise. We look at 34.4 as we want to work at optimum temperature with people, the community, and the environment. Love so, so we practice cradle to cradle. So all, all of our jars are reused when they're brought back. Um, everybody who brings back an empty jar gets two pounds off the next one. That's, <laughs> That's better than recycling, isn't it's it? It's much you better. You know it's going to get yeah. used again. Yeah. And if you bring back six empty black vessels, you get one freebie of your choice up to the value of 30 pounds yeah. because we believe so strongly that sh people should be reusing that we don't mind funding that that's so lovely yeah. it's so good and then it also saves on wastage yeah. and everything it's well brilliant. and also it saves on transport costs yeah because every time i'm making now and the other day i made a batch of 30 creams and i think it was 22 were reused jars yeah now that's that's really started to look promising because I'd like to order only once a year. Yeah, I love the other the other thing that you do to save on um, wastage is the combination of like things like the soap is for hair and body. You have the the combination of things. So what other products have we got here? Should we talk a little bit about yeah. the the products? So you've got the hair and body soaps, and yeah. they're vegan as well. Yes. So all the soaps are vegan. Um, I, I do an absolutely fantastic um, shaving. Oh, shaving look at this soap. dish! How cute! So that is, we call it the sphere. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, it looks like a flying saucer. It does. It does. And it's all glass. So some people think it's plastic, but I guarantee it's all glass. And you can you can see here it's got this lovely green colour. Um, that comes from Tamanu. Oh yeah, that smells lovely. So mm. Tamanu, I, I, I'm now starting to import things direct. Where is Tamanu? Tamanu comes, um, Tamanu comes from Vanuatu, which is in the South Pacific, that's which you go on holiday home. to from your, from your yeah. home. Um, so that's really our next phase, is to import directly so that we know where our oils are coming from and who's making them. That's great. Um, and Tamanu is an amazing healing oil. Um, it actually stimulates skin cell growth. Oh. So it's a fantastic thing to have in a shaving soap. Okay. Um, doesn't dry your can we out. women put this on our face too? <laughs> no, you can shave your legs with it. Oh though. yes, brilliant. Yeah, it's yeah. A, you can shave your legs with it. Um, yeah, so that's that's the shaving soap. So for men and women, um, then we have toners, which are um, essential oils suspended in um, floral waters, which can be used as a makeup remover, a toner, and an aftershave. That's amazing. Yeah. So all multi-purpose. Yeah. And then one, the, um, one of our most recent products, which I really love, is um, apricot kernel oil, which in, in fact is the base of a lot of our creams. But I then started experimenting with it because I wanted to, pr to produce a makeup remover oh. and discovered that it's absolutely fabulous. It's an empty bottle. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to smell. I'll give you, give you one to smell. Um, we we realised that, yeah, you can test it. Oh, that bit we realized that it, it yeah. works really, really, really well as a makeup remover. Oh, wow. so, and we do reusable pads, which I'm also extremely proud of. Which would remove makeup and um, moisturize at the same time. Yes. Wow. So, so many products, makeup remover products particularly, have a water content. Yeah. So if you put water content into a product, you need to put preservatives into a product. So I thought, well, why don't we make the pad wet yeah. Fresh every day, and then just drop two or three drops of apricot kernel oil. And it's it. gentler on yeah. the eye area yeah. for those of us so that have sun damage from Australia. It's really soft. Oh, it's really yeah. soft. Yeah. What's it made from? It's, it's organic cotton. It's just cotton. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. So, so that's a really terrific makeup remover. Um, very simple, but of course you can also use it as a moisturizer. Mm -hmm. um, it's also part of our Baby and Me collection. I was going to say, it's, it's probably gentle enough yeah. for babies. Yeah. So Baby and Me is uh, our four products for mother and baby to use. Yeah. So the mother can use it as a makeup remover. Baby, it's a great all over body mm -hmm. oil. Massage, baby massage. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so again, that's a multi-purpose. Then I have another one here, which is also part of that collection, which contains my Tamanu again. Mm -hmm. um, macadamia. And macadamia, which comes yeah, from Australia. Comes from Australia, yeah. yeah. So, um, I was eating them yesterday at my cousin's oh, I love house. Those. Yeah. love those. 
So, so that makes a great nappy rash cream because tamanu um, stimulates skin cell growth. So it's really great for rashes yeah. and for any kind of skin damage. It's beautiful. I love it, and I'm sure it's really. They're all really good for eczema and things like oh, that yes. as well. I mean, I, I actually struggle to say that one of mine isn't good for eczema. Yeah. I mean, I virtually, particularly this this collection here is all made without scent. So that's another thing is people are really obsessed with scent. Mm. And I do have essential oils in this collection here, these facial okay. moisturizers. But I, but um, the longer I sell products, the more I, I actually am persuaded that it would be much better if we could get used to not having so much scent. Yeah. So essential oils are effectively medicines and we just overuse them in everything. So although these are really, really great anti-wrinkle and everything, um, because their 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 efficacy is um, the recipes are really anti wrinkle and anti aging. I actually think if we could get particularly younger people used to th using things without scent, mm. then they'll never get quite as addicted to scent as we've become. Yeah, yeah, it is addictive, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Like, oh, your shampoo. Mm, yeah, you smells, smell yeah. Good. Mm, yeah. And then you're bombarding your yeah. system probably with all these different smells. And yes. Yeah. I did a perfume course this week, which was really interesting. Oh, it was yeah. like how much, because you do, she she kind of like laid out 25 different scents and we went through each one. I thought I was going to get completely overloaded, but because yeah. we did one by one, yes, the, I didn't go nose blind, which I thought I was going to yeah. go by the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. But you do, you can get barraged and then you don't know kind of what's going on because our sense we, we lead with our nose more often than we think yes. like when you walk into a space and you smell a smell that reminds you of home or yeah. something like that yeah. uh, it really links to memory yeah well mm. i mean also uh, in german for example there's an expression i can't stand the smell of him <laughs> yeah um, i well, mean we're, they're they are really already in language yeah. that actually scent is is very important and i and well, I, when you say something is bad it's like oh that stinks you know exactly yeah exactly so so i i actually think also those interrupt our whole animal instinct of smelling somebody uh, and knowing whether this is a good smell for you to yeah. be with or a bad smell you can block your intuition yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so interesting talking to you. <laughs> I could talk to you for days. So thank you so much, Elka, for talking to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure to connect with you and to have you on the show. Just to remind our, our viewers, how can they get hold of you? How can they order your products and find you? So um, 34.4.com, all spelled out in words. In words. Online. Um, at the uh, Cobbled Yard, which is in Stoke Newington N16, 1 Bouverie Road. So the whole yard is number one, um, but we're right at the end and we've now got a little handmade sign um, ceramic sign saying 34.4 if we're closed we're always open on the weekends from 11 till 5 Saturday and Sunday and also on Broadway Market E8 which is London, London Fields, Fields. Yeah. Um, and there we're opposite the Dove pub which serves terrific vegan and vegetarian meals oh, by the way so you can come and get your skincare yeah. and have skin a nice care and have a meal yeah amazing and yeah. come and chat to elka she's a font of knowledge i love it <laughs> amazing honey thank you so thank you much, very much. thank you thank you for watching thank So what are your brand of essential oils called? They're called Zephyr. And Zephyr. Zephyr, which means, do you know what it means? Is it, I just think of a hot air balloon, like one of those <laughs> flying machines. Oh, that's Zeppelin. Oh, that's a Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> no, Zeph Zephyr means warm wind. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly I'm not that great with my languages. <laughs> I love it. And and so it, do these have a separate website to order? They have from? a separate website. Um, it's zephyr.uk.com. Zephyr.uk.com. Thank you, Elka. Amazing. Ah, thank you. These are actually, uh, these are actually nebulizers, not diffusers. Oh. Because I did eight months worth of research. I wanted to sell uh, reeds in, uh, in jars. I'm just going to grab across the camera. Because I actually wanted to put reeds Little in there. Little so flying around you. I love it. No. It's actually it's gonna get stuck in my hair and it's minute. dive bombing it is, it is actually it is. trying to sit in your hair <laughs> oh it's still there it's basically the diffuser i've set going look it's going to the beehives they're gonna love oh look oh. he's trying to freeze me yeah. 
So, yeah, so I, I actually wanted to put reeds in this. So this is like the big seller last Christmas. I could not find a recipe for the liquid in these things. So I went into other shops, the ingredients, you're supposed to list ingredients on the back, but if it's not a skincare product, you don't have to list ingredients. So people are buying these and have no idea what they're breathing in. That was my first discovery. I couldn't find a recipe. I, uh, I experimented with it and nothing worked. So that tells me, I mean, I may be wrong, but that tells me it's highly chemical. So those reeds that suck up the liquid that you, you put them in uh, have got to be a chemical product that you're breathing in in your house. So I scrapped that idea. Then I wanted to do um, burners. And then I thought, okay, well, I can sell the burners with little um, wax beeswax candles or soya candles. But then I thought, well, when people run out, what are they going to do? They're going to go to the pound shop and buy 50 for, for five pounds. So then again, they're, they're breathing in petrochemicals. So I scrapped that idea. Then I thought, right, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a diffuser. I discovered that if you burn a diffuser, you put water in, um, collects mold, so then you have mold spores that you're also breathing in, plus the fact that in this country you can only buy plastic ones. So I scrapped that idea. Then I started research to try and find something that was plastic free, by which time it was October and I thought right well this is obviously not going to happen this Christmas. So it took me another three months to source these amazing what are called nebulizers. So when you switch them on you can see that it starts to steam up and they work from pulsations. So you put your pure essential oil in, no water, um, and then what you're getting out through a very tiny um, hole at the top is the actual pure essential oil. And the best thing is it switches itself off after 10 minutes, gap for 10 minutes, and then back on again. So that you haven't got this pumping essential oil for two hours continuously. You, it goes on and off for two hours. And it's completely plastic free, apart from the USB port, and a couple of the components inside. This is ceramic, this is glass, and I have replacement glass for that as well. And then I have another one, which is rubber, rubber wood from old rubber plantations from defunct trees. So again, that works exactly the same way, on and off switch there, um, and that has even fewer plastic components. And just the USB port at the back. So that's a way that you can actually burn essential oils pure without water content. When you clean them out, you simply rinse, um, put a bit of alcohol in it to disinfect and um, clean out the essential oil, um, and then you put your next oil in. And you have a collection of oils here too, don't you, Elka? Yeah, so um, I'm selling frankincense, rosemary, lavender, cedar wood, orange, thyme, and lemongrass as a base range. But what I'm also going to expand into is mixing and doing perfumes, because what a lot of people don't realize is that you can't put essential oil straight onto your skin. The only one that you can do that with is lavender. Um, and um, actually also cedar wood doesn't have any, um, um, I can't remember the name now, um, elements in it that, that you will be affected by. So you can use cedar wood as well. But quite often when I'm, when I'm on the stall, people put them onto their skin directly and it's really not a good thing because you actually get a chemical buildup in your liver from that. So that's something that I'm looking into as the next thing is to actually do perfumes suspended in pure oils.